Okay, yeah. Uh, well, welcome. Thank you very much for all turning up. It's nice to see everybody of you here. Um, that's good. Uh, now, you have to understand one thing. I have to be very careful because my boss is in the room. Andre Martin is here, and he's my boss, or one of my many bosses. So um, <laughs> I better be careful of what I say. Actually, he's fine. Uh, we work really well together. Um, so I'll let people settle down for a few more seconds, um, and then I will start talking. Um, I just realized when I put up this slide that actually I stole the slide from somewhere else. So you will notice on the top left it says Bauhaus. So I was at Bauhaus and gave a similar lecture to this uh, a few months ago. But since then I've been to about ooh, something like five or ten uh, venues of conferences and places and things on. So the great thing for me is, is after I spent a, you know, a lifetime dealing with computers is to actually look at the future and see what computers and artificial intelligence can actually do for us in the future. You're the lucky ones because you're going to actually experience it. I can just dream about it. Although some of these things I expect will be coming sooner than, rather than later, I think. So, um, what will happen when cities will have autonomous cars? Um, this is the first slide of the presentation I'm giving in a couple of weeks' time in uh, Paris, uh, because there is a conference there called Smart Metro, and I'm going to tell the Metro people that they've got everything wrong. Uh, so that's going to be an interesting experience. <laughs> we will see how that pans out. And I thought for first I would just expose you to, um, can we play this thing? Does this thing not play? No, I can't believe it. This thing doesn't play. Why doesn't it play? Why doesn't it play? Oh, no. Oh, well, that's really, that's annoying. This, this, this video doesn't play. I'll show you the video separately sometime. Okay. So what do we, what do we, what do we, what do we design? Um, so we'll go on to the next one. So one of the things that I think you all have to address is this big issue about whether the future is actually going to be a dense cities with dense cities or whether it's going to be uh, a city of sprawl because transportation will be so much easier that everything will sprawl. And frankly, I think it's a completely open issue. Uh, this building here is the kilometre high tower that I'll talk a little bit about the reason why we did that. So obviously complex buildings, this is what we did before PLP was set up. So this is under construction, this is uh, Abu Dhabi Airport. Um, and it's big. Uh, you can see uh, we overlaid on the model of London, it's absolutely huge. So I was in charge of the geometry group that did the geometry for this one. So it's a series of tangential circles. I'll speak a little bit more on, on that kind of thing, which is really the design technology. The other thing I'll talk a little bit about is intelligent buildings, because this is something that's really beginning to rear its head now. Uh, this is Deloitte's headquarters in Amsterdam, and it is the most energy efficient building, office building in the world. Uh, it is entirely self-containing as far as energy is concerned. Um, this is facing north, this atrium, so it doesn't get a lot of solar heat gain. On the other side, we've got solar panels. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about how that building functions and what we're learning from that, because that will clearly be coming down the line, will be a huge issue. So one of the big issues, I think, is how is society going to decide to live in the future? Um, this is something that we're discussing a lot actively in, in the office. You know. Will the office disappear as a concept even? Will the idea of work become morph into something different? This idea that you live somewhere and you work somewhere, and the nature of work is going to be very, very different. But we're still stuck with these old town plans because cities take a long time to deliver. So in order to, a few years back, we started thinking about, well, what about tall buildings? What is it that limits tall buildings? And of course, the thing that really limits tall buildings are lifts. Um, and lifts have got this com completely bizarre idea that they just go up and down in one single shaft, which is just insane, basically. So uh, we said, well, let's have a look at different type of transportation technology associated with tall building. So you obviously remember this movie uh, where they have cars attached to the outside of the building and they travel up and down. And I think probably attaching the cars in that way is 
maybe a little bit optimistic, but we decided that we designed a system which is beginning to do similar things. So this is what we call the Skypod. And the Skypod is basically you stick the lifts on the outside of the building and you attach them to a track. And that means that the whole of the inside of the building becomes available to be planned and used. The core disappears as a concept. You would imagine that things like uh, lavatories and the like will become much more flexible in the future. This, of course, this is just a show off. I mean, <laughs> this is what you do to show off. <laughs> so it would be, it would be a big, big, big building. So about 20,000 people would live in it, roughly speaking, that order of magnitude. Um, so the main thing that we did it for is to explore the notion of a transportation system, which is much more like a train system, but where the train, the pods, individual pods, would actually uh, move individually. So it would start down in the basement and connect directly up to whatever underground railway system you have. It would have a station at ground level where pedestrians arrive. And then it travels up, up the building. And of course, whatever goes up has to come down. So you have nice big loops at the top for the, for the, the transport to turn around. So this is the, the, the basement level next door to the metro. So you walk directly from, from your, from your um, metro into the, into the pod. So it's none of this business having to go upstairs or anything else, walk straight across. At a ground level, where you have lots of people coming, of course, on foot, assuming it's in a city, uh, you need also to have arrangements for that. And then, uh, if you have a track system, of course, the most important thing is to be able to separate tracks. So if you've got a track and vehicles, pods wanting to go far past you, you need to have a slow track which stops. So that functions much more like a normal um, lift system where people are um, um, uh, uh, arranged that they go into a particular pod to go to a particular floor. And then we have a great big hole in the middle because the building was so deep, it's about 120 meters deep, that of course a lot of space want to have window space. So we punched a big hole through it, so essentially we got two 30 meter bars on either side, so our expectation was that they were going to be hotels and the like. And that's why we have a big crossover station where you think crossover, and that's where you get off and something like six or eight hotels in that, in that building. You'd go, go from this crossover station up and down into a different direction to your hotel room. So it was sort of fantasizing a bit. Um, and then on the upper level, of course, you would assume you would have penthouse suites and all that kind of stuff. And then you have a loop that loops around, a lower loop, and then you've got a higher loop. And then this is where you really want to show off because you can then run around in the loop and turn around. So, of course, you can be in the cabin still. So one of my fantasies is that we're going to let these pods to restaurants. And you, you could have a one-course meal. You only go around once, around a loop. You have a two-course meal. You go around two loops, and so on. Um, you know, so lots of people, one would assume, would just go up just for the, for the, for the view. So this is you know, the most spectacular view that you can possibly think of. So what is the technique that you need to make this sort of thing work? So you need two degrees of freedom. That means the pod needs to be able to turn in both planes because the track will go, it can be above, the, above, beside, below, and it will turn and twist as well. So it needs two degrees of freedom, which above all means that the track can torsion, so you can, you can actually swing it around. Um, so that's the kind of thing that's important there. So then we come to this thing of not getting the animations to play, <laughs> which is very annoying. It really, it's something to do with your... Okay. Anyway, uh, the thing that led us to start thinking about the car tube was the notion of demand-led scheduling. If you start thinking about it, the only transport transportation system that's worth having is something that's on demand, point to point. Why do you want to have anything else? You want it when you want it, and you want to take you where you want to go. Basic, simple principle, which most transportation planners seem to have forgotten. Um, okay, the power of geometry, well, you know, you can do very interesting things with parametric modeling. Uh, it's a very big building, you can do lots of interesting stuff. So, you know, this is the kind of stuff that we were doing. Um, this is the, the, the central thing, it's, it's a very large span building. And this glass wall here, the client came along and saw this, I think this image or something preceding it, and said, it looks rather big, this glass wall. Uh, 
uh, is it the biggest in the world? And we said, we don't know quite, but might well be. And he said, make it so. <laughs> so it is now the largest glass, glass building in the world. We also designed the Crick Institute, which is you know, just down the road from here. Uh, again, parametrically designed. Um, you, know, you can do lots and lots of variants. Uh, you just you know, reset your parameters and so on. So now we come on to actually talking about the car tube. So here's my proposition is what is an ideal transport system? What is it you actually want out from it? Clearly, when it comes to urban transport, we've got a huge range of problems. Every single city here suffers from congestion. And one of the things that we managed to do, which is pretty disconcerting, is that we have abandoned to a large extent the ground surface to the car. And you look at these plans and you see that there's more and more open space. But most of that open space is given over to cars and to green spaces which we tend not to use. So it's a bit peculiar what we have actually done in terms of town planning and where we got to. So what is it you want with a good transportation system? You want it to be convenient. So you want it to go point to point and you want it to go directly to where you're going. You don't want to change get off the bus, onto, you know, it's ridiculous. You also want to have a system that actually uh, incorporates every mode of transport, whether it's a public transport or semi-public transport or rented or owned vehicle. Why should you have a different system for any of those things when in fact they're all trying to do the same thing? The obvious problem in big cities is speed. You know, we are traveling at a ridiculous speed. 15 miles per hour in London is ludicrous, completely insane. Uh, I mean, how have we ever got into the stage where we do that? And the interesting thing is the tube is not much faster. The tube is a little bit faster, about 20, 22 miles an hour average. But that's still ridiculously slow. I mean, why? So, and having cars around that kills people seems to me like a seriously bad idea. Uh, so we kill over 1,007 uh, 1, people. In, in, in England, when I was in the States, they were arguing about whether they killed 30 or 35,000 people. Um, so, you know, not a good idea. Uh, it's a bad system. We absolutely have designed systems that are sustainable environmentally, for sure, which means essentially we need to get to electric propulsion. But there are other, other um, environmental things which are very bad, and sound is one. Sound is a, is a real killer. People live less long when they live next door to a noisy road. So this is something that is really is quite important to when you conceive of new transportation systems. <coughs> you want a system that's fairly priced. Uh, the monopoly position of railways in the UK means the price of the railway tickets is just going up and up and up and up and up, and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. And there are all sorts of ways in which you can do that, and dynamic pricing is one of the more interesting aspects to that. So we were looking at London and saying, well, what could you do if you built a system of tunnels which were relatively small, the same size as a tube tunnel. You can push ordinary cars down there, but because they're digitally controlled, they don't need to overtake. So there's absolutely no reason why you would ever have a wider one than just a single tunnel. And then the most important thing is how do you get into the system? And, of course, the thing with London, every, every big city in the world, is you've got all these motorways coming in. And the motorways, of course, are ready. They're open. Um, you know, you, you can drive down the motorway, and then you stop at the first traffic light. And that's when you should dive into, into the tunnel. OK, so this is the conventional way of thinking about how you lay out an underground. You know, you've got lines, north, south, east, west, and you've got interchange stations. But actually what happens if you start thinking about separating the tracks? So now suddenly you're looking at a grid rather than, uh, rather than, um, rather than separate tracks. And then you build in switches into the grid. And suddenly this system allows you to do dynamic switching. So you can travel around and do all sorts of things. And then what you do is you're, where you get off the system, you put it off the track, exactly like a motorway. You do not stop to get off your vehicle on the motorway. Well, you should never have to stop on the main system or the traffic system to get off. So 
Therefore, you need to defeat congestion, which is just terrible. Uh, it's not stopping stop killing people. We talked about that. Um, hydrocarbons, yeah, we need to do something about that. Um, unfair pricing, all of that. Now, this is the most important number in my lecture, which is the passenger density times the speed is equal to the capacity. And the passenger density is the number of people who are in a given length of a transport lane. And you think, oh, well, yeah, but trains are much better. Well, the reason why you think that is because you forget that for more than half of the time, for something like three quarters of the time, the tunnel is empty. It's just empty. It doesn't have anything in it. So your average passenger density is actually relatively low. So we clearly need to do something because the world is urbanizing and, you know, problems everywhere, all the rest of it. And one of the interesting statistics is that, of course, we have already chosen. We already chose to go down the car route. 80% of transportation takes, takes place in cars. All our cities are designed around the notion that cars can go everywhere. So the choice has already been made. So why do town planners insist that, no, no, you do have to have these things called undergrounds? So what is the technology that makes that possible? This is the technology. This is Platonic, a digital train. It's been around for ooh, 15 or 20 years. Every single car manufacturer has been running tests on this stuff. And what it means, basically, is that your cars are running nose to tail. And the big numbers, important numbers here, is the, the, the reaction time you have. When you're driving on a motorway, uh, you have to have a three-second reaction time because you're really slow to react. 66 meter separation. If the digital uh, vehicle is driving you, you can have a two meter separation and you can increase the capacity of the motorway by a factor of six. So this one here doesn't play either. Oh. <laughs> you can imagine what that one does, the one at the bottom left. Okay? So obviously if you have a simple junction system, you need to control in particular the way the cars go together. Um, and this is the primary grid, so this is three, so this is a system size for something like London, right? And you're traveling around and you don't stop, and then you have a local grid where you drop off things, which could be road system, or it could be stations, and you have obviously need to have stops in various places in order to be able to get off, particularly for emergencies, uh, but also uh, little stops. Um, in this original one, we, we, we predicated that you wanted to have um, uh, parking close to where your, your, your thing was happening. But the more you think about it, the, the really important thing about autonomous vehicles, which people keep on forgetting, is not that it can drive around full of people, but it can drive around empty. So actually, if you think about it, your vehicle, any vehicle, can take you to your destination and then just travel back where it came from. Because, of course, the roads are not going to be crammed on the way back. So suddenly the whole opportunity of vehicles just getting out of the way becomes an opportunity, a huge opportunity. So the other thing with the grid that's handy is that you get, a, you get direction. So because it's a grid and because you've got the inputs, it actually means that by definition that system will never be get overloaded because you just have to find an alternative route. The only thing that will overload the system is the destination. If the destination have you know, too many people arriving in a particular time slot, then the system will stop. And this is why, basically, you need some form of pre-booking in order for this sort of system to work. Um, and this was another animation that doesn't play. Ha! <laughs> so we, we've done simulations of this stuff uh, in processing and other stuff. So we keep track of all the cars and, and we're loading it up with the data from London Underground from the amount of, of traffic you get in London. So we're looking at basically three, three by three, so about six tube lines. This would essentially have a capacity of six tube lines, which is roughly what you've got. And of course, the user experience is important. That, you know, you, you pre-book and you get a slot. And you know when you're supposed to enter the system, that's where you go. And then, of course, you've got to design a way of getting in and out of the, of the thing. So the simplest way is simply tunnels. 
and you just have something just like that tram, it's just driving into the tunnel. You know, you have an autonomous car driving into the tunnel, perfectly easy, not a big deal. Um, and you can put those in various places where you can find space. Uh, that one there is, is somewhere close to our old office. Or uh, you can put a lift in if you're tight for space to get the vehicles up to the surface. So we've been looking at various lift systems. So this one here is a variant that um, is based on the Skypod. And of course, you have to look at these things. So we built models and looking at simulations of all these kind of things. But of course, you can stack them up and you, you can get increased capacity in all sorts of different ways. Um, you know, this is connecting to railway stations. So you've got a lift on every, on every platform that takes you down to the car tube where you've got essentially your taxi waiting. You can have a roundabout configuration. You can stack those up. And this is the kind of thing that you would expect to see on a platform or something. Uh, we ran a workshop and it was quite interesting that a lot of people said, well, why do you stop the lift at the street level? Why don't you continue it up? So this is looking at Aldrich and London School of Economics. And of course, you can put a lift shaft up in the middle of the road because you've now taken a lot of cars off the road, so you've got a bit of space. And to connect directly into the building. So suddenly you've got a really elegant transport system that you, know, you walk from your office into the lift, into the car, takes you wherever you want to go. And you know, this is just one version of how you, how you park things. But of course, the real key thing is this is rubbish. This is really, really deeply stupid. This is what it should look like. And this is what you can do in terms of you set a lane aside, the lane is a lane that allows you to enter the car tube. Uh, we've got whole piles of videos of this stuff, but um, for some reason this technology doesn't work. Where is my techie man? He'll have to explain himself. Okay. So how far have I got? Oh, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm just about on time. Five more minutes. So this is the Deloitte's headquarters uh, in Amsterdam. And um, we're having quite a lot of discussions with suppliers of IoT, uh, Internet of Things. And it's this whole idea, what is the Internet of Things going to do for you in terms of buildings? And um, this building here is very bright. It does know an awful lot about its inhabitants. It knows about itself. Uh, it knows about who is arriving in the building. It knows all of these kind of things. But you can't do it without decent architecture. And it's really interesting that the most used space in this building is this atrium. People love it. People love coming in there. They really do. And that fills up more, more quicker than any other part of the building. So this is, of course, the point with Deloitte is that they actually um, need to have very flexible workspaces. So in our case, 35% of the employees are away from the building at any one time. I mean, on average, you know, this is not every, 10% are on traveling, and then people are doing different things in the building, and they need different types of spaces to do their work at. So some of them want, need to have a working place, some need to have somewhere they can concentrate, some need to have customer meetings, very important thing, and internal meetings, so meetings is a big thing, what an office does. So of course you need to book things, pre-book things in advance. So I have actually, yeah, people are different, that's true. So they're not just all cast as one class of people. We all have different needs and desires. So the building is intelligent about that. It knows about things like the temperature, the lighting level that you want, and it actually responds to that. So, you know, there are some people who like it really cold, and then there are people who have got different attitudes to how they behave and where they want to be in, in the building. So all of these things are interesting to start to look at how people interact with their building, their behavior, and their patterns. So this is a different kind of environment that we are providing people with, so people can choose uh, from day to day or hour to hour where they want to settle down and work. So suddenly, you know, the idea of your own desk is, is becoming much less powerful. But I think this is a really evolving question, is the nature of work. So we are looking at some other solutions which are saying, you know, you don't have the person moving from place to place. You have the workspace reconfiguring itself around the worker. So there are all sorts of ways of looking at this, but we need to think about what buildings are supposed to do not just that they look splendid, but that they have behavior. 
And how do we, as architects, make that behavior interesting and useful? So this is uh, some of the, um, of the panels that can you know, be rearranged. And of course, there's apps. And the app knows about pretty well everything that you can possibly imagine. It knows about the spaces, find a suitable workspace. It also tells you where your mates are. Uh, that's right, find your colleagues. This is really important. You know, like it's a big building. I mean, it's like here. I'm sure there are places where you know, you're off in different parts of the building. You have no idea where your mates are. Uh, oops, sorry. And you control your environment. It's obviously an important bit. Lighting, heating, cooling, all that stuff. Um, sun lighting, all those things. And of course, you need to connect to the, uh, the, uh, the, the internet world and wireless world. Um, there is no ethernet wiring in this building at all. None. It's all wireless. And I think the next revolution is going to be when we go to wireless electricity. Because I think the electricity is one of those big constraints on how we design buildings. So I'm quite keen to have a look at that. So there we are. Um, yeah, half an hour. Now we can have a discussion. <laughs> <coughs> Most of the time, people raise objections and they say, yeah, but, I, but surely public transport is much better from a social point of view. And I said, when you were last in the tube, when did you last talk to somebody? And people then sort of slightly step back. Well, you know, everybody loves the car. Yeah. Everybody does love the car, yeah. <laughs> Well, if, if it, yeah, I get that, but if it does that, of course, it won't, it won't, it won't happen, and it's very simple. Yeah, yeah. Of course, of course it is, of course it is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we, um, well, it will only happen because the cars become better, and uh, people are fantasizing a lot about what autonomous cars will actually do uh, to, to how you behave in cars. So, some people are saying it's going to become meeting rooms and you will be driving around having meetings in your autonomous car. So the idea of having fixed buildings might even begin to move. But I think it's, it's easier than that. There are two things which people he hate with cars and planners hate with cars. And it is, um, the first thing is congestion and the second thing is parking. Those are the two things that really kills cars. And the third thing is that cars take up an inordinate amount of space on the surface and kills people. So those are the three things that I think we should get rid of. Um, and, I, and I think it is feasible to do that. And obviously, we're talking to manufacturers now about how you incrementally do this. So we made a proposal to the city of London um, only a few weeks back and saying, you're one hugely underused um, uh, resource in the city of London, which is called the bus lane. The bus lane is mostly empty. So what if you let autonomous cars, digital trains, on the bus lanes? And they will, of course, gradually take over what a bus is, because the bus has got this completely insane idea that it picks up lots of people and stops at every stop. Well, this is a really stupid idea. I mean, you know, <laughs> you should pick up people who happen to be going to the same destination at the same time. And if there's only two people doing that, then, it, then that's what should happen. But why do you want a transportation system that stops at every stop and mixes lots of people together and then disperses them? It's a completely insane idea. But the problem is we have been brought up since the Victorians to think that way. Yeah. But do you think in order to make this kind of shift... Yes. No, not necessarily. I think the only uh, industry that has the money to make this happen is the car industry. The train industry are not going to do it. The master planners who are building great big metro and things, which means that people can build great big stations that are really complicated and really expensive. I mean, most of the big interchange stations in, in big cities, you, you're looking at a billion or more to build one. You know, look at Tottenham Court Road. Um, look at Wall Street. You know, they are insanely expensive, those things. And why? 
because we can't think our way out of the fact that this is how transport works. But it isn't necessarily how transport works. It really isn't, because 80% of people have already chosen to use a car. So why do we force the other 20% to use shared vehicles? I mean, I've got nothing against sharing vehicles. That's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Our system would accept shared vehicles. You know, if you want to run it with, um, uh, with, with minibuses that have 10 people in them, fine, not a problem. And in fact, the nice thing in the digital world is that you can set up your policy so that's entirely digital. So if you have, uh, you know, Mr. Trump as president, then if you pay, you get there. Uh, but if you have um, Jeremy Corbyn as Prime Minister, no, only publicly owned vehicles are allowed on the system. But you don't have to redesign the system. You just flick a switch, a digital switch. That's all you need to do. Flexibility is the word. Okay, yeah, over there. I, I, that would most certainly be a combination, that's for sure, that's guaranteed. Uh, because there will be a switchover period for a very long time, 10, 20 years. I'm just about to write a, 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 a paper on, on the notion of basically setting lanes aside on the motorway to be for autonomous vehicles only. And that is something that lots of people are working on. There's a proposal for Vancouver, Seattle. Uh, there are several other proposals on, on, on those lines. Um, so basically, you just paint a lane and you say, this one is only for autonomous vehicles. And, and you will have a system that will, will kick off you know, ordinary vehicles if they try and get in, like you know, blaring sirens, arrests, uh, you know, losing your driving license, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that is certainly a feasible way forward, that you set aside lanes which are reserved for autonomous cars, which are, can form digital trains, and therefore a much higher capacity. As I said, you're talking about a capacity of about six times as big when you have a digital train as opposed to when you're running on a motorway. So since you have motorways everywhere, we already built them, why not use the motorways but increase that capacity by having intelligent vehicles on it? And that is where it can start, is maybe intra-city first, but then, of course, it becomes obvious that you should extend that system into cities. And this is where the, the issue of stopping distances and the like come up. So, you know, if you're driving at 30 miles an hour, it's about 75 foot that you need to stop, uh, which means um, part of that, about a third of that is your reaction time. So it's about 50 foot for an autonomous vehicle, which means that if a kid runs out, behind the car, you can probably just about stop if the autonomous vehicle runs at 30 miles an hour. But actually that's insane, because every transport system that has capacity needs to travel faster, because that's the only way to get more capacity. So that's why you need to have a segregated track, because at 50 miles an hour it takes 170 feet, 175 foot to stop. Um, so, you know, you, you, the, the autonomous cars are never going to coexist in cities with bicyclists and, and, and pedestrians, except at low speeds. So it's never going to produce the additional capacity when you mix traffic. You have to have a segregated track. And that's what the car tube is about, is saying, well, what is the nature of that segregated track? Well, the nature of the segregated track is that you can put them underground and release space on the surface for people, because that's where people should be. I mean, I do resent very much um, when you have big dual carriageways coming into cities and then you've got these little underpasses, horrible little things for pedestrians. It's ludicrous. You know, this, you know, the street, le the level, the ground is for people, not for cars to occupy them. So you need to think radically about it. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure, sure, sure. No, no. We have been starting to look at that, and we're, we're, we're working with various people to look at how you would uh, obviate that. An obvious uh, solution to that is, if you have a breakdown, is that the 
car behind you simply pushes you into, into one of these sidings. Um, and, and, or we might use robots to, to pull cars out. One of the key points, though, is that they are electric cars, and electric cars will intrinsically be far, far, far more reliable than ordinary uh, engines or engine cars. For one thing, they've got fewer moving parts. You know, in an ordinary car, so you've got 2,000 moving parts in an engine and, and all the bits and pieces. In an electric car, you've got 80. So it's a staggering difference between the complexity of the mechanism. So, of course, cars break down because that mechanism is really, really, really complicated, number one. Number two is once you have an autonomous vehicle, of course, it will perform health checks on itself. It'll make sure that you don't have a burst tire. It will know how your tires are performing. It will measure. Already cars are doing this sort of stuff. Um, so cars will get more and more and more and more reliable. So the number of incidents in the tunnel is probably going to be quite few. But you also need to compare it with the tube. The tube has got exactly the same problem. Your tube breaks down in the tunnel. There's an accident. Somebody falls ill. The whole system stops. And you know, on the, in the tube, it's actually worse, because what we were proposing is that you actually have a sidewalk so you can walk out. But have you ever tried to walk out of a tube train when it's stopped in a tunnel? It's horrific, truly horrific. OK, right, over there. Uh, sorry, sorry, I was missing part of that. Can you do it again? Yeah, is there not a case to be argued that the reason so many people go for cars or whatever is because there aren't the right connections to the public transport? Yes, that's true, that's true. Of course. Like if you're saying mm. the tunnels for trains or whatever energy, yeah, yeah, yeah. so often why can't we really yeah, yeah, that? Yeah, but, but look at it the other way, is uh, public transport is used less and less because people go in more and more cars. You know, you look at the countryside, bus, buses have basically disappeared. But it's, you know, it's quite smart to have a, a car system which, whether you own your car or not. Of course, you need to. It comes back to this thing. Transport should always be on demand, point to point. What is the point of running stuff around empty? It's completely crazy. You shouldn't be running things around empty. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, I, I really think it's a sort of fundamental issue that you know, all your bus station trams and trains, half the time they're running around empty. This is like pointless. Why are you running around empty for? Except to be nice to the unions. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so since you mentioned that it's like pointless to have stuff empty, do you think mm. it would be, uh, you know, here we have the night tube, mm -hmm. and it's like one train every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Do you think it would be more efficient to have, say, one small section of the train, so like mm -hmm. one or two wagons every minute, so sure. you're doing yeah. the whole train mm -hmm. every mm -hmm. 10 minutes? Well, you, you exactly got the idea. But of course, you know, with the night train, you've got the competition with Uber. And you know, most people, if they're drunk, they, they get an Uber taxi. And, and that's absolutely fine. The problem with the Uber taxi is that when it comes to daytime commuting and the roads are packed, it's actually making things worse because there are lots of Uber taxis hanging around doing nothing. The City of London are prepared to ban them because there are so many Uber taxis hanging around the corners of London. So you know, the City of London is getting crowd it out. But this is a continuing fight. But yes, I mean, I agree with you. No, in the tube, it's absolutely, exactly that. Um, we have some slides somewhere which shows precisely that. You take the train and you chop it in bits, and each one of them is actually, not only does it have flexibility in time, it's got flexibility of going directly to its destination. Yeah, right. Well, I, th I think obviously you need to look at a planning strategy for these things. So the street level pattern is actually quite good for distributing the last mile, what I call the last mile. Because if you think about it, um, every place in the universe pretty well has got access for a car. Well, you're not going to, one's not going to propose to put down every single road underneath it. The thing that destroys cities is big roads that come in and are carving their way through the suburbs. That's the thing that really kills cities. And, and indeed, when you come into the center of cities, 
It's the through traffic that kills you. So the local traffic is fine, really. So we would say, no, take a lot of cars off the roads, and then, of course, you can turn lots of streets into pedestrian streets, and particularly where it's a you know, pleasant thing to do, turn them into parks when it's on the embankment, that kind of stuff. But, but the important bit is that the last distribution is done by, through the system that we already had, called cars. That's fine. Last mile, you use the car. Fine. But you don't have to get out of the car. I mean, one of the worst things that I can, I, I cannot un understand how we could possibly have done it. You build huge car parks by railway stations. And then you drive the car there and you dump this expensive object that you've just paid for to get to, to another expensive object that you paid through through your taxes. Yeah? And meanwhile, your investment is sitting there doing absolutely nothing, and you're using this other thing, and then you come back. It's like, no, you invested twice. What's the point? Completely ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, 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 uh, sure. I mean, one of the big things here, obviously, is that a lot of this stuff will happen in new cities. So one of the things that we have been toying with and we're experimenting with is looking at building a city where you set the basement level entirely aside for transportation. But instead of having roads and parking spaces, it's all free running. So the vehicles are running. Some of them are running fast because they're going to pick up somebody. Others are just kind of hanging around. And they're hanging around this lift here because they know that usually, you know, my boss usually comes down at this time and wants to go somewhere. So I'm just going to hang around. But there's no distinction between the parking and the moving. It's the same thing. But above, you then have a proper city. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, I know, I know. Huge arguments from lots of people, okay? So I'm, I'm neutral, as it were. I, I, I think some people prefer to have their own car. Other people would prefer to share a car for either economic reasons or for social reasons. Fine. That's not the issue at time, eh, that we're discussing. This is where I think people always get it wrong because they always associate the car with a particular social class and a particular behavior. And going on a public transport network is socially better in some sense. And I think it's pretty well irrelevant, frankly. Yeah. Right, no, no, I agree, I agree, I agree. And, and the, the, you know, the reason for owning your own car, of course, is that then you, that car becomes your friend. So, you know, it, it'll be probably have you know, um, face uh, recognition to get into the car. Uh, it will greet you and say, oh, I know you. And then you will say, ah, yes, but my Uber car can probably do that as well. But I suspect if you own it, you can actually morph it more into what you want. I mean, the main thing is you can leave your own junk in it. I mean, that is the main reason why you'd want to have a car, because your kids' toys are left in it. Come on, you know. Yeah, right. Right, yeah. Yes, we have. We have had a look at this. And it's very surprising how much space there is left underneath London. There's a huge amount of space. Now, the first problem is that if you design such a system, you would most probably not want to do it underneath buildings unless you really have to, because it does raise lots of, it, lots of issues. But there are loads of roads in London which hasn't got a tube underneath them. And you know the, the network that I showed you, that's all running underneath roads uh, which don't have any tubes underneath them. It's not, uh, there's plenty of space there. It's not very deep in some places. Uh, we were thinking between 20 and 30 meters, uh, because then we would be off, quite often below the existing tube network. So the deepest tube is uh, Westminster, and that's about 30 meters. Um, so we'd be quite deep, I think. But again, it will depend on circumstances, you know. Yeah. yeah sorry, 
Well, as I say, above ground, it's this thing of having a segregated network. So if we have a segregated network above ground, it's called motorways. They already exist. That's absolutely fine. The problem is that once you get close into cities, they stop being motorways. And that's when your congestion appears and all the rest of it. So we say, you know, use the motorways, of course. I mean, it'd be crazy not to. Um, but, and it may well be that if you build a system like this, you may well start with uh, building a flyover or a tunnel just over one of the most congested traffic junctions you can think of. And only the autonomous car is allowed to go on that bit. So if you want to provide an incentive for people to buy electric cars, electric autonomous cars, you can say, ah, look, you can use this special way. And it might only be 100 yards long. But it will avoid that particular traffic jam. But then you could then gradually get it to grow into a bigger and bigger system. But as I say, I mean, the logic of this system is that it's not that likely to happen first in the UK or even in the West. I think it's much more likely to happen in countries that are grabbing opportunity to do with digital information systems and have got the money on the cloud to do it. So the obvious two candidates are India and China. And that's where I expect this sort of thing would actually happen. But of course, once say, the Chinese acquire the technology to do this and acquire the know-how to do it, everybody else is going to follow them. So um, if there are any Chinese here, would you please introduce me to your rich bosses who can spend some money on this? That would be good. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Everything is digitized. Mm -hmm. And yep. then recently Russia hacked it and took down the whole of the system. Oh, absolutely. The yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, yeah. How, I mean, how can you deal with it? Anything that's to do with the Internet of Things has got absolutely that issue. It's an enormous issue. I couldn't agree more. But, I mean, cars are only, you know, a, a, a smallish fraction of the Internet of Things things. So, Everybody, you know, if your building is fully aware, uh, if somebody attacks the building, it will kill you, you know, because it will deprive you of oxygen or, you know, um, the set of fire or any of those things. So we are already having to rely on defending ourselves against those things, particularly with nuclear power stations, water supply systems, electricity grids, and, and you know, those systems are being attacked all the time. Ukraine have had attacks and so on. Does it mean that we abandon the idea of digital connections? Doesn't seem like that. So I think it's a problem, but I think it's also soluble. Yeah. How long would you forecast it would take? Well, I mean, London could be many decades. It's to stir people into thinking about the opportunities of what you could do. We're not, I'm not that serious about thinking it could ever be done in London or that it would be done in London. I think it might get done in London by, say, 2050, because every other big city in the world has already done it. And the London's going to look at it and think, oh, God, this is ridiculous. Why the hell haven't we done this before? And if you are a traveller on Northern Line, you will be screaming for them to convert it. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, just, just, what do you think about the social implications? Because it seems that every time we actually optimize our mm. life, whether it's the transport, the light bulb, mm. internet, yeah. uh, personal computers, mm. we actually increase demand rather than increase the freedom that we have. So if we have yeah. this incredibly Good effective point. system mm. where you can get yeah. from work yeah. to yeah. home yeah. Yeah. without yeah. traffic, yes. So yes. what do you think the ramifications of that would be? I, I think there are certainly big implications, and I've not absolutely no idea what they are. Uh, this is one of these unknowns, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, but, yeah. But I mean, that's just saying it would be so much nicer if we just had a horse and cart, you know, because the car was obviously an insane invention that did really bad things to society. It did do really bad things to society. It did do some good things to society as well. But that's just saying you can stand still. I don't think you can stand still. I really don't. But as an advocate of this, you would yeah. be someone. Well, yeah, yeah. well no, I think exploitation is, is part of life. 
Uh, and, and, but if you want something to happen, you have to play with the big boys. And the big boys are Googles, Apples, Amazons, car manufacturers. Those are the big boys. They've got money and resources. And they are out, out to exploit you. Of course they are. They want to exploit you. But you, know, you have to fight back by buying a horse and riding home instead. But you see what I mean. I mean, um, there are lots of people, I think quite rightly, who say the lifestyle we live in big cities is not a terribly sensible one, and maybe one should live, and then people make lifestyle choices. But I think transportation is such a big issue for urban planning that it needs to be thought about. Um, because most people just say, oh, here's an urban master plan, here are the roads. Here are the sight lines that means that all the buildings have to be this far apart. And you just calmly accept it, uh, that the road engineers are governing your life. And I think the road engineers should be challenged. OK. Right, I think I'm just about having to run. So one more question, and then and I'm going, yeah, one more question. Sorry, you speak up again. Yeah. You mentioned something at the end of your lecture about wireless electricity. Oh, yes, that's right. Uh, my question is, how would you go about implementing this wireless system? Okay. And also, mm. where would be, right. where is the source of the Right. Where well, the, the electricity, of course, will come from all sorts of sources, including, most, one hopes, mostly sustainable resources in places, wind, you know, sun, all that kind of stuff. But one of the very interesting facts is uh, TRL, Transport Research Laboratory, wrote a paper not that long ago about induction charging. And it turns out that you can charge vehicles electric, you know, digitally uh, if, and this is the big if, if the car is autonomous, is controlled, digital control, so that speed is absolutely accurately controlled. If you can control the speed, then you can charge the car as it drives. You just need to have basically a magnetic strip built into the road. So you, as your car is driving down the road, it will charge. But it will only work if the car is digitally controlled. So the speed is absolutely rigidly controlled. Then it will work. So that is quite a feasible way forward. People also, I mean, there are at least set several tests being done on this stuff already. Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. Yeah. One, one of the big things um, with power is the way you distribute it and how flexible you are about it. So I'll tell you a story here. Uh, I'm working with a company that designs linear motors. They built um, lifts that are six kilometers high. They have also designed uh, lifts for the US Navy. And the US Navy, if you have an aircraft carrier, you have 5,000 people on it. 4,000 people of those are maintaining the steam system and the hydraulic systems, which are horrendous systems because they will always leak, they will always have potential for disaster because you work with high pressure. The US Navy want to replace those entirely by electric systems, magnetic uh, catapults, and that means that instead of 4,000 people doing the maintenance, you have 2,000 people doing the maintenance. And I think the world is moving generally in the direction away from mechanical systems, away from hydraulic systems, away from airborne systems even. So I think you know, air ducts in, in, in ceilings are soon going to go and we're all being be all electric because electricity can be controlled digitally trivially easy. And that makes for a huge revolution in how you think about anything to do with energy, um, you know, including in your buildings. I think your buildings will be all electric in the future. So that will change things. Okay, I've got to go. I'm sorry. Thank you very much for having stayed. <laughs>